Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next time, I will. I'm going to put off the part on causality, which is at the beginning, the four causes of the question concerning technology, because it fits perfectly with something in your reader, namely pages 40 to 48, where Borglund is, is talking about how uh, a, a wheelwright in uh, a, a century ago understood his job for making wagons, and it, the four causes are just illustrated exactly the way Heidegger describes them, and you can see how it's still a marginal practice that you can get in touch with, and how it could have been the main way of doing things. So, in your reader, you've got Borgman, and part of the Borgman is, is several different bunches of pages. It's this on causality. Okay. And over here, I'll just put the notes of the bad tweets on, on Nietzsche. And to go on truth. In Dwinnell, what was it again? Uh, 370. 374. 374. Okay, at 5. So we have to end immediately at 5. So anybody can run over there who wants to. She'll start late because she knows. That I some of us, we can. I think they said 370 on the seventh floor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, 370. If anybody thinks that's wrong, now is the time to say so. I, I have no evidence. Independent evidence. Okay, now, but today we're going to do the question concerning technology, and we're going to finish it next time. And I'm going to just sort of go through and read it with you and try to and, and feel free to talk so that we can because part of the interest of this essay is finally we've got and maybe I should give this kind of prologue as I see it in my mind so we did the meta stuff first about the history of the West having its beginning and then turning into metaphysics and then we switched to the actual history of the West that it came in at the time when the subject-object metaphysics came in and then and read the age of the world picture. And now we're reading the current understanding of being, the current truth of being, to talk Heidegger language, or uh, we're, we, we want to understand the technological way of revealing or the technological clearing. And since Heidegger wants to make a big distinction naturally between the technological clearing uh, and technological devices, technology, since the clearing is, as he puts it, not at all technological, uh, the furthest thing from being technologi technological, I mean the clearing being the style, of the, the coordination of the practices to produce a style, to get things to show up a certain way, but so I, I, I try to remember to call it technicity, that it, just so we can have a different name for it and won't get mixed up. So Heidegger's trying to understand technology by understanding it as a mode of revealing as our current clearing. And he's calling the style of our current clearing technicity. Now, that's just the framework. Now to get into it step by step. And, and his goal in doing this is like his goal all along to get us to understand that our current style, technicity, which he's going to try to describe later, uh, is just our current style. Not, not more and not less. I mean, that's already pretty amazing and it determines, remember, how what things show up as and, and, what, and what it makes sense to do and it gives us meaningful differences if there are any. They're pretty minimal at this point. Uh, it, it, or in another way to put it is how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others, how we relate to entities. So the style is tremendously important. So, but when I say it's only a style, I mean it's not metaphysical. It's not the being of beings. It's not the way everything is everywhere all over the universe only we're the first to have discovered it. Uh, it's just the way we are in the West now. 
And then I said just again. Well, the, but of course, that's pretty important and it's hardly uh, nearly the way we are now. We can't change it just by willpower. We can't even fully understand it because we're so immersed in it. And that, but that's the job. And if we could do it, that is, get an understanding of technicity, then what the goal is, is to have what Heidegger calls a free relation to technology. That's what he says right at the beginning and he comes back to it later. It's, it's going to free you up from this metaphysical understanding where you just automatically, and because you have no idea there is any other way to do things, and you think anyway it's the right way to do things, just behave with the technological style. He wants to, as he says right at the beginning on the very first page, we'll be questioning concerning technology, and in so doing we'd like to prepare a free relationship to it. The relationship will be free if it opens our human existence to the essence of technology. So now I have to say a word about that. You know, from past already, he said it already in basic questions, that for him, the essence of something is not sort of the necessary and sufficient conditions of something that counting as technology. Uh, it's not some universal characteristic of technology. To get at the essence of technology is to get at the way the practices work when they've got this particular style. There's a good footnote about that. He ta- they, he's got the way in which something pursues its course and he's got uh, stuff about how it uh, presences and maintains itself and so forth. All that is ways of getting at what I would just simply say we want to understand how technology, how technicity works. And, the, and of course, and this is what I said already, but I'll read you the passage, this, whatever that is, technicity, that's not technological. That's not a bunch of technological devices and it doesn't, it doesn't have the way of being of technology. The clearing, the clearing is what gives everything else the way of being of technology. Yeah, John. I'm just trying to, there's never been a free relation to, a, to any prior clearing. clearing. Interesting. Good point. Except the pre Socratic. Don't you think they had somewhat that would be free? A question. Ah, well, it's a good question. Certainly once metaphysics sets in with Plato, and truth is understood as correctness, and it's understood that when you get the being of beings right, you just get how they are, and you don't have to be a preserver, and you don't have, and you're not grateful. You just that's it. But now, the, the, remember, we have this puzzle that the pre-Socratics were sensitive to the clearing. That is, they were. No, I think, I think they did have a free relation to it, in the sense that they understood that they were preservers of it, and if they stopped preserving it, it would go away and they were grateful for it, and uh, they weren't as free as we are, because we are free to uh, get in touch with marginal practices and other understandings of being from our past. They didn't have that. So I guess the answer to your very good question is, there are two kinds of freedom, a free relation, one pre-metaphysical and one post-metaphysical. You looking worried about that? uh, I'm not sure why the pre one counts as a free relation. Well, in, in so far as it's not well, it's, it's free not in the sense that they could go to some other one, but insofar as they understand their role as being preservers. I mean, the Athenians sort of have a freer relation to the Athenian way of life. They understand that it's up to them to do something about it and, and so forth. That's all I meant. Whereas if it were metaphysical, they could just sit back and it would happen and there wouldn't be anything they needed to do. But to be really free, in, in, to be able in a certain sense to take it or leave it technology, which is what Heidegger wants us to be able to do. Uh, but notice, I mean, we'll get back to this. Of course, you can't just leave it and walk out of this style into the blue. There's, this is the only style, the only full-fledged style we've got. We've got bits of other styles around. So you can't really leave it but you can certainly modify your relation to it. He talks about how you would modify your relation to it. You won't feel, let's just read the next sentence here. Well, in the same paragraph, on second paragraph on page four. The essence of technology is by no means anything technological. Okay. Thus we shall never experience our relationship to the essence of technology, that is, technicity, that is the way the clearing works when to produce our understanding. We'll never uh, experience our relation to the essence of technology so long as we merely conceive 
and push forward the technological, put up with it, or evade it. Uh, everywhere we remain unfree and change the technology whether we passionately affirm or deny it. So on the Luddites are just as what badly off as the techno freaks. None of them have a free relation to technology. But if, if we, we will, if we understand this course, and not just, of course, intellectually and go around repeating it. He said, remember what he says, and you can't just go around and say, aha, Heidegger says, technicity is so and so. But if you understand it in a way that changes the way you, really deeply, and it can change the way you behave, that's what he wants to do. So, uh, and, 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 and his na- another name for it, which I've used already, but it's so frequent in here, I want you to realize it's the same thing that he's talking about when he says that technology is a mode of revealing on page 12, about four lines down. And it's familiar talk. It connects up with what we've been reading in the basic questions. He says, we are questioning concerning technology and we arrive now at Aletheia, at revealing. Ha ha, of course. And what was has the essence of technology to do with revealing? The answer, everything. For every bringing forth is grounded in revealing. Now, here it gets a bit confusing uh, because bringing forth, he, pr- he then proceeds, huh, how will we put this? I mean, there's, bringing forth is poesis and he immediately goes into this part we're going to talk about next time, the, the, po- the poesis mode of revealing and, and, and how it's related to, uh, to our current mode of revealing. And in a certain sense, of course, there's a very weak sense of bringing forth in which the (coughs) query enables us to bring things forth in any epoch. Even now, we bring things forth. But our particular way of bringing things forth, he says, is challenging forth. In other words, we're not in the nurturing business anymore. You could contrast the way he does, the way people were bringing things forth when they planted their crops that later. Oh, well, top of 15. Uh, see, maybe I should, maybe, maybe I'm confused. Every bringing forth is a mode of revealing. No. I don't know. See, I want to say technology isn't a mode of bringing forth. It's not a mode of poesis. They're all modes of aletheia. They're all ways that things show up. I think he's using bringing forth sometimes in this broad sense. He says every bringing forth is ground for every bringing forth is grounded in revealing, and he's just talked about aletheia. It looks like he's talking about um, any way that things show up, but then he immediately starts talking about poesis, the certain kind of showing up and from then on he talks about that for a, quite a while and so I don't really know you, you I have a, I guess I thought I thought I understood this but I'm now see I'm not sure how to use the term uh, I'm going to use poesis to, uh, as he says at the top of 13 techne belongs to bringing forth to poesis and so <coughs> forth and I'm going to distinguish that from challenging forth which is what technology does at the middle of 14 and yet the revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology does not unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poesis the revealing that ru- rules in modern technology is a challenging force which while I'm at it the middle of page 14 the translation is wrong which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy now who could say that why would that be unreasonable I worried about the translation I mean that sounds something like I don't know an ecological uh, story or something, but and there's nothing in Heidegger that says that it's unreasonable to supply, to force nature to bring supply energy. There's no unreasonable in the German. It just says which calls to nature to supply energy, which can be extracted and stored. Why is it? I don't know. I have to go back to the German. I, I won't do it now. Uh, but I, I remember worrying about it and, and have it crossed out here. But I don't remember what the, what, what, why that happened. Um, 
but so it, 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 it does put on nature this demand and the difference between poesis and challenging force he explains very well at the top of 15. The work of the peasant does not challenge the soil of the field. In the sowing of the grain it places the seed in the keeping of the growth, forces of growth and watches over its increase. That poesis is nurturing, remember. It, it helps the thing come forth. The seeds are, the, if you play with your kid with a poesis way, you help the kid develop whatever it is the kid is good at and enjoys doing. That's very different from the way we do it now. When you think of the Central Valley, where you put on as much fertilizer as you can and pesticides as you can and get this, make the Central Valley just into a producing area and make it produce the maximum amount of stuff. That's what he says next. It sets upon in the sense of challenging it. Agriculture is now the mechanized food industry. Air is yields up nitrogen in the earth or, no, well, never mind the nitrogen, he gets as far as the fertilizer and then he goes off and worries about uranium. Uh, so, we're now going to talk about the technological style and find out what it is now that we've got this general introduction. There's a technological mode of revealing. <clears throat> so, the first thing you might think is that the technological mode of revealing is that we objectify things. That we, and this challenging force makes you think maybe that we dominate things and we control them in order to satisfy our desires. Do you, do you have enough of an ear for the course to know why that's not the right way to think about? Well, no, you wouldn't know because I haven't even posed the problem well. But if... Well, there, there's something very peculiar about our situation and Heidegger's situation. We're going between two different understandings of being as he writes this. We are sort of not fully in either. And the modern one, which is the technology, which, sorry, which is the Cartesian one, which is the subject-object one, that's the story of domination and control and having, the, having our subjective desires and objectifying things and making them fit into our normative realm and satisfy our plans and show up in our ground plan and all that. We've heard that story. That's not challenging for us. That's foreshadowing. That's placing things before us, so to speak, on our terms in a static way to satisfy our fixed desires as subject, as autonomous subject. And now, Heidegger's never, isn't, and we are certainly partly in that. To give you a feel for it, people say that uh, modern industry and modern technology is what made, what, what overcome, overcame nature, built bridges and railroads and uh, uh, electricity, got, got lighted up the, the, town, the cities even at night and got water and all that. We, we, we're still doing things like that and, and building durable, stable, middle-sized dry goods like refrigerators and cars and stuff. We do all that and that's considered the modern industrial technology that everybody notices and talks about who worries about this sort of thing that there's some new kind of thing coming in which is the, the sort of high tech if you, it, which is very different very flexible where things are, are, are made to conform to all sorts of different combinations and desire and you know, 300 kinds of Walkman and that instead of, in, when I was young, there was just Fords and Plymouths and Chryslers and Buicks and, that, and Dodges, I guess, and there was one kind of each, and that was that. Before I was young, a little earlier, the Ford is famous for saying they can have a Ford in any color they please as long as it's black. Uh, they, uh, they, there was, I mean, but now, flexibility, and you can change your, your desires, and, you can, and, and the products will in, uh, sort of elicit new desires, and this kind of post, so let's call it postmodern. I mean, postmodern is very misused, but in this case, I mean, if there is such a thing as the modern subject-object understanding, then there is this new level of, of industrial uh, technological development, which is personified, of course, or what exemplified by the computer, and even more so by the internet, which is a different form of 
technology than the subject object time. So now let me go back. So when people talk, of, when, when you hear challenging force, you might think that it was just exploiting, objectifying, dominating, and controlling. And control was, remember, one of the things on the list of, of the world picture story. And, but, and Heidegger does talk that way sometimes. Uh, I brought a quote from 1940. This is 1953, he's saying. He, he first said the question concerning technology. Eight years earlier, he was still talking in a way that much uh, more like he, he was in the subject-object mode. He says, Western history has begun to enter into the completion of that period we call the modern, which is defined by the fact that man becomes the measure and center of being. Sounds familiar. Uh, man is what lies at the bottom of all being, that is, in modern times, at the bottom of all objectification and representability. That's, that's fine. That's a, like a summary of what we read. But there's something else going on now besides objectification and representability. And, it, it, and what modern technology, the postmodern technology is something really entirely new and different. And Heidegger begins to understand that. But for a while, this talk on 14 and 15 where I was about challenging force and about how you relate, how you relate to the agribusiness relates to the Central Valley, that sounds more like this sort of heavy industrial time. It, it's and it's only gradually that he gets a sense that there's something new and different going on. He talks about, on page five, he says, that technology's always been instrumental, and we've always sort of used things to satisfy our desires. Uh, that's correct, but not true. And then he jumps to the claim in the middle of page five, the technology is something completely different and therefore new. And it turns out it's so new and so different that it isn't even a subject-object story anymore. It, the way he figured this out, and it just doesn't, isn't in this course, is reading Nietzsche as the last metaphysical thinker. He found in Nietzsche an understanding of being a step beyond the subject-object understanding of being. that owed a lot to Descartes and couldn't have happened if there hadn't been a subject-object understanding. But he reads in Nietzsche phrases like constant overcoming and uh, the will to power, which he understands as the will to will, as no more a story about subjects with specific goals and desires, dominating objects, and making them satisfy those desires. So one way to put this is Heidegger went to a stage in which he was like a like a ecology uh, person or a green, in which he really felt that this sort of exploiting nature was the problem. He says in one point, we're turning the world into a gigantic filling station. Uh, and that's not wrong, that's correct, but I think he'd say now, not and, and, and even true insofar as we're still in the subject object. But insofar as he wants to get a technicity as something new and different, then that's not got it. So we have to find out now, well, what is it when you, he does get it? Well, I think he gets it when he, when, well, he gets it when he reads Nietzsche. And we get it in here, not on page 15, or even the top of page 16, but he finally gets it at the bottom of 16. But let's just, uh, the top of 16 is the wrong way to think of it. Well, let's say, the hydraulic power station on the Rhine is like a work of art in the sense that it really holds up in a glamorized way that shines and, you can, and, and shows you what we're up to. And so he's going to do an analysis of it. What understanding of being does the power station on the Rhine, the hydroelectric power station, show us? And the first story is very much a story that sounds like uh, it's all a question of controlling nature. He says the hydroelectric plant is fed into the current of the Rhine and it supplies hydraulic pressure and there's a network of cables. And then in the context of the interlocking processes pertaining to the orderly distribution of electrical energy, even the Rhine itself appears as something at our command. And 
that's two subject objects we subjects you know turning the Rhine into an object and even at the end of that paragraph he says uh, but the Rhine is still a river in the landscape is it not perhaps but how and then he says in no other way than as an object on call for inspection by a tour group ordered there by the vacation industry why do you laugh because he he falls right into it there he is in the subject object business and then he goes into a really different wonderful story the revealing that rules throughout the mo- modern technology well isn't that interesting because he doesn't have a word postmodern here I just didn't realize I mean he's I mean he's stuck with this thing that uh, he I mean I'm making clear a distinction between modern and postmodern but he isn't because he sort of in this transition that I would just write in post you could put it in brackets it isn't in Heidegger but now he's going to move to the post part because the object stuff is the wrong story I mean I'm not making this up I mean I'm going to read you a line in a minute where he says there things aren't objects anymore so it's not my idea but his idea that, that this can't be right the tourist story or at least it's you know it's right it's correct it's even true about part of the way we still practice but now what's new in our practice okay the revealing that rules throughout parentheses post modern technology has the character of setting upon in the sense of challenging force but now we get a new story about challenging force it does not mean dominating and controlling the challenging happens in that the energy concealed in nature is unlocked what is unlocked is transformed what is transformed is stored up what is stored up is in turn distributed and what is distributed is switched about ever anew Unlocking, transforming, storing, distributing, and switching about are ways of revealing, but the revealing never simply comes to an end. What an amazing claim. No more objects, no more control. That's not the point. The point is endlessly flexible, uh, adaptable, situationally appropriate switching about. And it's not even true what he says here. But he's, but, and that's part of the reason he's having such trouble. Notice, I mean, it's wrong electricity is not switched about ever anew it finally comes out giving us the light to satisfy our desire for lights or heat whether you're coming into the radiators for heat or the electric blanket or the radio I mean it doesn't it gets sent to subjects however he's got the right idea electricity is the nearest thing he's got to what he thinks is the sort of paradigm stuff that is revealed by technicity what if he had digitalized information that's what he needs which is switched around ever anew and it's, you can put it on CDs and take it off CDs and re-record it and, and listen to it and uh, send it around and you can turn pictures into the di- into digital and that's, see, we're getting to the point where things could really be uh, transformed stored up distributed switched about ever anew and it isn't clear what we would be doing in there yet because I mean we still we think well here we are we want to listen to that music or something but if you think of this now even further and again it getting, becomes the internet and then lots of information is being switched around in this flexible way and stored and, and used but re, re put back into the system and so forth and if you think of sort of global uh, conglomerate uh, transnational companies that switch around their offices and their workers to any part of the world where 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 work is cheaper and and uh, companies keep taking each other over and transforming and swallowing each other up it's getting more and more like the picture he has of uh, of what is fundamental about the new understanding of being namely I think if you sum it up so far we've got that it's flexible uh, we're soon going to find out more about what it is that uh, but let's just go so far this regulating itself is for its part everywhere secure regulating and securing become the chief characteristics of challenging revealing that's but then he gets and le- then he introduces let's go on I mean it's such a good essay really that you can just read it sort of page by page as long as you see that he's sort of developing his own or maybe your understanding as he goes along if, he, if he's developing just ours he certainly is not making it easy by talking about objects all of a sudden but here's where he gets rid of objects on the top of 17 what kind of unconcealment 
is it then that is peculiar to that which comes to stand forth through this setting upon the challenges? Everywhere, everything is ordered to stand by, to be immediately at hand, to stand there just so it may be called on for further order. And see, he's really got a different idea. This is not the story about dominating, objectifying, stabilizing, use, consuming. It's not a consumer story. It's standing by for further order. Whatever is ordered about in this way has its own standing. We call it standing reserve. That's one of the magic words. Heidegger now is running for thinker in that uh, he's going to name this new understanding of being that's moving in on us. He's going to name both the being of beings and he's going to name the way the clearing works to produce beings with that kind of being. This is the name for the being of beings. Beings are bashtan, that is standing reserve. But you need a feel for that. And the feel for that is to substitute the word resources. We call it standing reserve because he's making puns with the word bashtan uh, and, 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 and stockpile and, and standing by and all these German associations which are nice. But what he thinks is that everything is turned into resources that can be endlessly re-aggregated, or disaggregated and re-aggregated in all sorts of ways, flexible ways. That's half of it. Just so I won't keep telling you that there's another half, let me see if I can jump to it. This isn't the order I expected, but there is the other half of it. Must be very near there. Well, I'll tell you, we'll find it pretty soon. The other thing is that it's optimizing. That it's, it's trying to get everything into the optimal order. Both, I mean, what is the optimal order? Well, it's the, it's the whatever order there is in things that makes them always easily reorderable. That it, it turns out that what we really want is ordering just for its own sake, he thinks. That's what he thinks Nietzsche was getting at with the will to will. And, and with constant overcoming. Uh, and, but let me, let's take it step by step. I won't try to jump ahead. So we got Bishtan now. Uh, and notice the end of that paragraph now. This, I rest my case there here so you won't think I'm making this up. Whatever stands by in the sense of standing reserve no longer stands over against us as object. Period. So Gegenstein, in Heidegger's pun, has become Bishtan. And that's why he's using this word. Gegenstein is that thing over against us, the object of which we stabilize, objectify, consume. Bestan is this stuff which is resources. And if you're really following this, you'll see a very interesting thing, which I never would have put this way until this minute. That it doesn't make any sense to think that subjects could all become objects because they, well, anybody, any subject can become an object for another subject, but there's always got to be a subject in there. But everything could become resources, even us. And that's what's interesting about this new kind of stuff. We could also become completely flexible, adaptable, optimizable uh, kind of entity. That's what he thinks is happening. And I'll give you phenomena to back that up in just a minute. So he says... There are going to be no more objects uh, in when this really gets fully developed. Uh, and he gives us an example of the airplane standing on the runway in the next paragraph. An airliner that stands on the runway is surely an object, somebody says. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the answer is, of course, that's correct. That's, but that's not true. See, that doesn't get at the being of the airliner. The airliner's mode of being now is to be just a cog in the transportation system, flexibly switched about to uh, fill up this, this growing, systematic, global, adaptable transportation system. He says that, he says, but then it conceals itself as to how, as to what and how it is. Revealed, it stands on the taxi strip only a standing reserve, inasmuch as it is ordered to ensure the possibility of transportation. Uh, and, where, and he says, once upon a time, a machine was an autonomous thing, an object. Now, he says at the end of the paragraph, the machine is completely unautonomous, for it has its standing only from the ordering of the orderable. And, and I think he's close to saying that people 
aren't going to be subject to anymore, but they'll be resources that they'll claim. So the tourist industry produces people who don't really have desires to go to uh, wherever, Tasmania or someplace, but the tourist industry tells them that that's where they want to go and then and thereby produces a lot of uh, the other resources whose job, who's, who are there to fill these claims that need to be filled as they go around. He talks about, talks on the, on the next page, in the, in the second paragraph, about the current talk about human resources, about the supply of patients for a clinic gives evidence of this. So they have to have a supply of people for all those airliners. Yeah? Is there a difference between um, the network relations that you're describing that embed the airplane, the thing which the airplane is embedded such that it not the object, and um, the way the equipment and totality work for coping, coping activity and speaking time? Interesting. Interesting. Okay. The, the idea that there was a time where there was just an autonomous machine, you know, I don't know how you... That's good, that's good. That. That's good. Uh, and yet, there's a difference. We have to think about it. I mean, uh, the way the hammer, and in being in time, Heidegger says, you can't have a hammer without nails and wood and people whose job it is to be carpenters. It's the, the, refer the, the equipment forms the totality of interrelation in, and it's interdefined. And it looks like, but, now, this is very complicated. The answer is hard, let's think. But that can't be quite the same thing as the technicity story because he thinks that, they, that there was always an equipmental totality, if, even if it was Aristotle's time. And, I mean, and certainly there was. I mean, if there were ha uh, shoe people who had hammers and tacks they needed uh, and shoes and so forth and they, the, there was equipmental totality and yet in the equipmental totality there was the equipment didn't have or had a kind of autonomy he thinks that equipment doesn't have now I mean I think he would say that the referential totality is correct but not true and I'm trying to figure out why I'm mean, correct because of course the equipment is always instrumental it's in order to do something, as he says in Being in Time. And you can't have any instrumental equipment without being in equi equipmental totality, as he says in Being in Time. That's going to be correct. But now, what's the difference? I tried when I taught this last to see if I could distinguish the difference between the tourists who are supposedly taking these jets just because they've been given these desires by the transportation industry and it's all one big system that isn't really there to to reach any goal and everything is just a cog in the system i said suppose there was what would it look like to see to, for somebody still to be in the subject object mode and i thought well how about the ceo of a company who has his own private jet who really isn't so just sitting on the runway as part of the, as the transportation system, but sitting on the runway to serve this guy who has his desires to get to some place or other. Now you can see that that CEO is going to become part of the trans, <coughs> trans global switchaboutable fire any any CEO and replace him with another system pretty soon. But he may be still somewhat in the old form. So now what would we try to distinguish? This, of course, this jet, when John's and John, is part of a, a referential totality. No jets on the runway without runways, control towers, uh, uh, mechanics, and so forth. And yet, I think Heidegger sees it as a, a, not just a quantitative, but a qualitative change between that and this, this plane that's part of the trans. Just not there to satisfy anything except that United goes, gets bigger and gets more partners and serves more countries. Uh, now, why could this be? Does anybody have anything they want to say about this? Uh, sounds like a good paper topic, unless we figure it out. I mean, I think, I think it's safe to say that Heidegger thinks, and I bet he's right, that, there, let's get this, that there's a difference between being a Gegenstand and a Bestand, difference between being an object and a resource. And it's got to do with whether something sort of comes to an end and satisfies a subject's desires and gives them control, or whether the end is just the more flexible, better functioning of the system. 
but I haven't said anything more than that. Uh, first you and then you. Yeah, let's hear some help. Well, there's something different, like uh, you mentioned uh, the craftsman's tool. Mm -hmm. There's something different than the there, Right. Um, I mean, there's something different. All of your tools are a totality, right? But they're not interchangeable so much. That's good. Uh, you, That's good. The airplane is really just sort of like, you know, the sea, the system, that airplane is just uh, something that can be transformed into money. Uh, and then, like, it just, it, it doesn't have any of its object. You know, it's not like a thing. Well, it can be good. turned into. I mean, it's a, I think you want a better track. Maybe you want a better track a minute ago. I mean, you could think that the old carpenters with their tools, it was their, you know, hammer and saw. They cared about that. It wasn't just any old hammer and saw. And I mean, you can get as extreme with musicians. I mean, you just don't give a violin. It's just any old violin. They really want that one. And the idea that. The more interchangeable they are, the better, which is part of this, right. is not a craftsman's view. And the autonomy of the equipment is maybe that's the autonomy. Of course, it's still in a referential totality. I mean, but 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 they cared about the particular piece of equipment as their equipment, which they had really gotten to know and and took care of, and so forth. I think maybe that's what he thinks is missing. Yeah. Like it's like a of earth again. Like when when the planes, you just, you know, you trade them, you yeah. get rid of them, you get, you know, upgraded ones. You, I mean, it's just sort of, you, they, they rush through much more quickly. Yeah, okay. it's not like having your own private right. plane, and that seems important. Uh, and that's the only economy I can think of, because John's question is still right. I mean, there is no such thing as autonomous equipment. Uh, and it's the Earth again? I was going to say, yeah, it seems like it's What's important in the other picture, in the old picture, is, is the particularity of that thing, right? And even if it's the, the private jet, it's not so much the privacy of it no. as sort of, you know, pride in that meaning sort of her. You, can, you decided on the, the color and you decided on the furnishings inside. And, and so appreciating the object, the thingly okay. character of okay. it. Like okay, well, that might be. That might be. I don't, I, I, that goes with subject object, you think? There's still some thingly character. There's, there's some left, although already right. subject object is moving away. Right, right. right. And, and, and the we, taxman is, all, okay. is, is not paradigmatic. Yeah. Subject yeah. Subject. Okay, and we get rid of the thingly character. I mean, uh, that, I mean, we would like everything to be interchangeable and optimal, and, that, and there's no other reason to have this plane except that it flies faster. Like, like the computer. I don't know. Does anybody develop a kind of personal relation to their personal computer? You do? Uh, I don't think I do. I'm ready to trade it in as soon as I find one that's faster and more flexible without, without shedding a tear. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, another, I guess, difference between the referential totality and things as resources, and things in the referential totality for the sake of which, yeah. I mean, would you say that resources really well, maybe they don't have a forsake of which. Aha. Well, that's another possible move. For those who haven't got being in time, haven't read being in time, the forsake of which is that the carpent, the hammer is finally for the, for a carpenter. And it, and the carpenter, is the, these, these roles, I mean, what hammers are for is finally that people like carpenters uh, use them. I don't know. I guess those things. See, the trouble is, I mean, it's the for the sake of which meant sort of what desire it satisfies. I think it would be back in the subject-object thing. But the for the sake of which is a very funny thing. It's, it's for the sake of somebody who has the identity carpenter. And I don't know where that is. But you know, I think you've got an important point on, but of, of a following sort. And it's a very open, a whole new ballgame. That the, the, there you were really, is it subjects that are using this? We haven't talked about that. Well, no, the sub, the, if the people using it are also switched about a lot, so that you can, you, you have different, you, I, there's, the, let me quickly, there's a book called The Corrosion of Character by Richard Sennett, which is popular now, which says that the average person now has 12 different jobs, not just, you know, works in 12 different places, but does 12 different things in the course of their career. They don't have one identity, which they're getting better and better at. And they don't have any character, it turns out, because character is a subject-object notion where you develop through your life, you, you perfect your, your skills and your identity and your uh, 
values into one uh, sort of solid continuous thing. And so then when he call, says sort of the corrosion of character, he's criticizing the fact that people are becoming more and more just adaptable cogs in the system and they don't have a fixed identity and they don't ha- develop character. So Richard Sennett says, and so that's the other end. So the for the sake of which, which once was a fixed identity, being in time, he says, what's, how does it go? Uh, I'm trying to think of these words where it's unchangeable practically. Uh, do you remember for it? It's, like, it's this thing about, I'm thinking in Division Two when you get a, when you get one of these uh, authentic commitments, it's steadfast and, uh, steadfast, and resolute, but steadfast. I mean, steadfast goes with subjects, and you see, and 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 people don't want to be steadfast anymore. I mean, that's now. Think of, I mean, you have to get a feel. We all have it. To both these fields. I mean, now that would be to be stodgy to be stuck in the same job all your life, and and, and too easy. I mean, what's really interesting is to be uh, to train people. We want to train them now not to be steadfast, but to be adaptable. Uh, yeah. Is, is he concerned at all about the issue of with reciprocity and relationship and seeing something as a resource not to control, but more of the reciprocity that, in other words, you know, it's not... I think I know what you're saying. Let me try this. Yeah. He's concerned with it as the poetic, that is, nurturing form of relation to people and things, which was the one... Not the one before the subject-object one, which was already the, the objectifying one. He thinks that those practices are still around, poetic practices. And in many situations, I think he would think they would be the, the ones that you would, uh, would, would be appropriate or something like that. Would, you would be called to do them. Except insofar as you're already sort of totally into the subject-object style, you wouldn't be able to see any nurturing opportunities anymore. And by the time you're in the uh, technicity style, the Bashan style, you certainly won't see any chances like that anymore. Well, what you see, I mean, I know, I hear this from my friends, is networking. That's the, that's the, the technicity mode of relating to other people. Uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say something. Um, it was interesting in description of sort of what United is up to, right? Um, is there's two ways you can hear it. One is sort of them uh, creating demand so that they can get ever bigger and control a bigger share of the market, right? But the other part of what you said is so that they can serve more countries, right? And it seems like there is also this, um, you know, uh, offer more flights, have more. So it seems like as the subject fades out, so does the subject controlling some portion of something. So the subject, and it does become somehow more like, more like sharing of resources. Oh, oh, oh. That's right, sharing. No, but see, when you get to the United, it's got the Star Alliance, and now there's seven different companies, and, and they're all part of one company. That's it. I'm thinking of that. It, and, and I'm sure the CEO could be switched for another CEO without any, anybody batting an eye except the CEO. And, and even he will go to another growth, company. Right? Their growth helps everybody else's growth. Growth yeah. all over. That's, that's the picture. Uh, that's the flexible global economy. Yeah. You know, it's back to being a time story. Okay. I think the, the question occurred to me because in gaining time, I want to account for um, the, our understanding of ourselves as subjects and the stuff out there as objects according to the breakdown today to the fundamental totality goes to the present hand. The present, the present hand as the being of the, of the entity is only ever, which he would describe as the ob- object in the Cartesian sense, it only ever shows up for us um, in particular Cases, you know, we abstract from that case, the philosopher abstracts from that case, then the um, being a being. And so the, the story that is told in being time of. Uh, don't worry, you now in being in time, people. Oh, okay. Just don't listen. Well, don't look, yeah, well, you, you should, you should. We should right. talk in my office. Right. It doesn't sure. feel right to me. Sorry. Uh, it's, but it's interesting. I see where you're heading. And I, let me just say quick, and then we go back to where everybody's in on it. I mean, it looks like in, in, in being in time, Heidegger's already beyond subject object, but he doesn't know what he's in. Uh, and that might be true. Uh, okay, let me get back. That would be funny because though he was beyond it, so to speak, in his thinking, he wasn't beyond it in other aspects of his understanding of sort of what was going on in the culture. He was still thinking about objectifying is what we're all into. Uh, anyway, let me, let me 
everybody happy to come back to where we were. Let's go to see now. We've got optimization. Now, that's what I was looking for. Now we'll find it. So we've got these... Um, on, on, it's back, I skipped it. It's on 15. It's important. We've got to go back there. It's right after the field. Uh, the second paragraph. I said flexibility is the first paragraph. And now something else. This setting upon the challenges for the energies of nature is an expediting, and in two ways. It expedites in that it unlocks and exposes. That's not the important one. Yet that expediting is always itself directed from the beginning towards furthering something else, towards driving on to the maximum yield at the minimum expense. That is, instead of having any particular goal, just optimizing, getting the most flexibility, the most order. You sort of get that feeling in the computer when you get the idea that it's going to be faster and faster and faster and faster and smaller and smaller and smaller. After a certain point, it doesn't really matter how fast it is. It's as fast as you could possibly want it to be and as light as you could possibly want it to be. But there is just this tendency to get everything to be more ordered, more uh, flexible, and, and, and it, it goes on to try to get those maximum yield at minimum expense, which I'm going to call optimizing. That isn't part of when you're building bridges and railroads and, and, and Model T Fords, optimizing is not the name of the game. It's just objectifying, stabilizing, and so forth. Okay, did I see a hand? Now, uh, so, and now I want to just illustrate. It's always interesting to have somebody who gets it all wrong. Since none of you got it all wrong, we'll use the guy who, wrote, who did the translation, who ought to know better. On, twi- on, on Roman numeral 19. I mean, you'd think he would have read this rather carefully. Uh, but there's a wonderful paragraph there, which is part of the moral. is never read the translator's introduction. If they understood things, they'd be writing better uh, books and so forth. 29 or 19? Nine, no, 29, sorry. 29. X-X-I-X. Okay, I'm going to read you the second full paragraph. The rule as such, the the, the rule of such a way of revealing, which is the technological, we just said in the previous paragraph, is seen when man becomes subject, when from out of his consciousness he assumes domination over everything outside himself. I read this because it just shows how what a rut people could can be in, in 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 thinking this this way. Uh, without paying any attention. Domination over everything outside itself. When he represents and objectifies, in objectifying begins to take control over everything. That's like a summary of the age of the world picture. Has nothing to do with this essay, or hardly anything. It comes to its fulfillment when, as increasingly the case, things are not even regarded as objects because they only import qualities become their readiness for use. Well, he's getting closer. That's the closest he gets. Today, all things are being swept together in a vast network. He's got that. In, 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 in a vast network in which their only meaning lies in their being available to serve some end that itself will be directed towards getting everything under control. Now well, he blows it again. Um, and then he says that's standing reserve. So that's, that's to help you beware of falling into that. And now I want to, I'm going to read you something. I mean, and now we want, we've been doing it already, in fact. I don't have to read you this, but it's pretty... Interesting. You ask yourself, well, what is the contemporary phenomenon of everything becoming resources? And, and really, what I want to switch to is, what is it like when people tend to become resources and stop being subject? And for that, I found an interesting article in the New York Times of 1995. It's a lot easier to see now than it was in 50 years ago when Heidegger wrote this, apparently. And the, there was an editorial called An Era When Fluidity Has Replaced Maturity. Maturity, like character, is a Kantian notion. I, mean, I remember Kant said the, the Enlightenment is when humanity becomes mature and takes responsibility for their lives and lives according to principles that they give themselves and so forth. So now maturity is out. The author of this says, many, for many people, shape-shifting and metamorphosis seem to have replaced the process of maturation. And then she quotes Robert J. Liston, who's apparently a famous therapist, who notes in his book, The Protein Cell, that, quote, we are becoming fluid and many-sided without quite realizing it. it we have been evolving a sense of self, a sense of self appropriate to the restlessness and flux of our time. Well, there's somebody 
in tune with the current understanding of being that's moving in on it. And then she gives her little gloss on that, which is kind of nice. She says, certainly signs of flux uh, that Mr. Liston describes can be found everywhere. On a superficial cultural level, we are surrounded by images of shape shifting and reinvention from science spy pictures who morph from form to form to children's toys that metamorphosize from people to vehicles. Well, that's really stopped me. I'm, are you of the transformer generation? I thought so. Women are not. I thought only boys had transformers. Women have transformers too. My daughter still had little pretty ponies. Well, uh, my son had transformers. But anyway, as it gives you pause. Why all of a sudden this interest in transformers? When I was a kid, the toys stayed what they were, and, then, and, and more power to them. It was the better for it. I mean, but now it's not an interesting toy unless it becomes something else and maybe two other things. And uh, maybe that, I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if that was the understanding of being in the practices, getting in there early and getting people to appreciate that, that transforming is where it's at. Um, and that, so that, that really struck me. Uh, and then there's also a lot of stuff which I think may be less important by Sherry Turkle about how on the internet you can take on different personalities and you can even have characters that morph if you push a certain button and take on some other personality. And then there's apparently the story that in business that people form have more and more what are called hot groups, which are sort of business version of rock groups where these people get together to make one product and they stay together long enough to make this product and then they disperse into other <coughs> other hot groups and make some other product. But there's no long range commitment to some company or to some product. Uh, and all that is pretty interesting. Uh, apparently the, the, the Macintosh was the result of a hot group, so I informed him say. Uh, there's a book that has a good feel to this called The Soul of the New Machine. That's about 10 years ago now, where there, it's about the making of some uh, operating system by a group that was put together just to do it and then disbanded when they had done it. Okay, all of that is just to tell you that this isn't just something that Nietzsche and Heidegger made up, that Nietzsche really was a thinker and saw ahead, and Heidegger sees ahead standing on, on Nietzsche's shoulders, so he sees it sometimes a bit flickeringly. Uh, well, let's see where we are. I have done this page. So, subjects are gone. Remember what subjects are. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I yeah. like this thing that you have written in your notes about the difference between Cartesian subjects. Oh, have yeah. I passed it without reading it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, let's see. Techno power constitutes as what we might call a new kind of subject, an orderer. But this is the direct opposite of the Cartesian subject. Because of the center, he's not intelligible and doesn't produce objects. That's right. Oh, that is important. In fact, that's a new idea I had yesterday, so I'm not used to it yet. One of the things that I didn't understand about this essay, the many times I've taught it up to now, is that Heidegger talks about how it's no longer appropriate to think about airlines as, as, as planes as objects and makes it clear that this sort of, uh, it, 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 it's no, on the, most of the, a lot of the stuff we look isn't an object anymore, it's some transitional, flexible, transformer-like thing. But he never says that we're getting rid of subjects. I was just reading you stuff about that. So what does he think is going on? Well, he certainly knows that autonomous, uh, sort of Cartesian kind of subjects are on the way out. So what is the, so what are we now? Well, at the top of um, 27, he tells us what we are. And, and it's interesting, this whole paragraph, beginning at the bottom of 26. Yet when destiny reigns in the mode of inframing, it is the supreme danger. The danger then attests itself to us in two ways. As soon as what is unconcealed no longer concerns man, even his object, that does so rather as standing reserved, and man in the midst of the objectlessness is nothing but the orderer of the standing reserve. So now that's a new kind of subject, so to speak. That it's important that maybe we shouldn't even call it a subject. I mean, there is this human being, and this human being is still an agent, and the agent's job is to be the orderer of the standing reserve. Why isn't it a Cartesian subject? Well, remember, a Cartesian subject is got to be a self-sufficient, uh, so, and self-intelligible 
source of all intelligibility. Whether that's an individual conscious cogito in your, who you are, really are in Descartes, or whether, remember, it's the working class in terms of which you can understand uh, the, the badness of the capitalists and the, the law as an attempt to protect property and uh, nations as standing in the way of the in, in international unity of all workers and so forth and so forth. The working class is intelligible. They've got nothing to hide. Uh, unlike the uh, capitalists, and everything is intelligible in terms of the uh, of the fact that all value really goes back to the working class, and so forth. So, and then there's I mean, all these. Remember the sub the list of subjects. It's very important to keep remembering it because you tend to think the subject is just us. But we want to say that this orderer of everything is not a Cartesian subject. Here's the list of Cartesian subjects on 152. We read this, I'm sure, once, but it won't have to read it again. Set the first full paragraph, where it says, "Man." Sec, second sentence, man has become subjective. Remember, that means hypokimenon in Greek. That means that which underlies and explains all the properties. A table, remember I said, is a subject in Aristotle. It has the properties black and hard and so forth. So, now man has become subjective, therefore he can determine and realize the essence of subjectivity, always in keeping with the way he can be and will. So there's man as the rational being, that's Kant, at the age of enlightenment, is no less subject than man who grasps himself as a nation. So, you can think that, the, you can understand everything in terms of uh, how it contributes to being a good American, and the, the flourishing of the United States, or the Third Reich, if you're Heidegger, just before this. I mean, he's criticizing the Nazis here. This is 38, because he doesn't, because all these subjects don't work anymore. Uh, the nation, or a people, that's a folk, or a race, each of those is supposed to be something which is perfectly, obviously, the, the most important and intelligible something or other, and uh, in terms of which you understand everything else until man empowers himself as lord of the earth. Now that's interesting, because what is it to be lord of the earth? To be lord of the earth seems to be the last stage where subjects are turning into resources, but they don't know it yet. I mean, I don't, you can't tell it from that, but look on page 27, lord of the earth comes back again, that phrase. So let's read it, the next sentence. Uh, so he's the orderer of the standing reserve. Then he comes to the very brink of a precipitous fall. That is, he comes to the point where he himself will have to be taken as standing reserve. Meanwhile, I think meanwhile that means, or while this is happening, in the, in the, right now, in the course of this, man precisely is the one so threatened, exalts himself to the posture of Lord of the Earth. So just when you think, when, when he thinks that he is sort of controlling the ordering of everything, he's really in the process of just becoming one more thing ordered. That's the Heidegger picture. Uh, in this way, the impression comes to prevail that everything man encounters exists only so far as it's his construct. Uh, this illusion gives rise, in, I mean, that may be where we are in, in a certain kinds of postmodernism, where it looks like science is a construct, and society is a construct, and identity is a construct. And it looks like, I mean, we must be the ones doing the constructing. But then it's hard to know who we are. And it begins to look like there's all these constructs running around and that's all there is. Um, this illusion gives rise in turn to one final delusion man, that seems as though man is, encounters himself everywhere and only himself. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know if that illusion is really around. And then he gets off talking about Heisenberg and maybe that's what's got him off from thinking clearly about this. Heisenberg is a friend of his and he likes science and must have just had dinner with Heisenberg and discovered that everything was, everything was subject uh, or something. But anyway, the, the basic point is that there, what replaces the subject is this transitional stage where we understand ourselves as the orderers of everything. And when you get to that stage, you're on the way to becoming no subject at all, but just part of the one big system where everything is ordered. Remember I said last time that the one thing he couldn't, un he couldn't talk about in the world picture essay was this process dimension. 
the world picture seems to be static because of the picture metaphor and because of the subject-object stability practices. But now it gets clear that it, we're in a transi- that things are transitional and they're becoming more and more ordered and we're becoming more and more part of the system and the whole thing is totalizing into one big interconnected flexible system. That sort of falls outside of the world picture story. Uh, it's in there in the, in, in the research story, but he doesn't make much of it. I mean, anomalies get stamped out and, and science grows by producing more and more anomalies and bringing them all into the ground plan and thereby covering more and more and more until everything will, I mean, it maybe you'll never reach the end of it, but, but the idea is the ground plan is expanding and taking in more and more stuff as it produces and assimilates the anomalies. That means that, I, mean, I shouldn't just rush on though, I want to make a clear move, I want to make a, underline what I'm doing here just a second, because I've gone from one thing to another. Uh, let's stop with one. So, we're the orderer, and we're moving toward everything becoming resources. <coughs> Period. Now, another aspect of everything becoming resources that he doesn't stress, but which I think he sees later is very important, is that, among other things, all marginal practices are going to be swept up into this. Because one of the special things about technicity is it doesn't allow marginal practices. That's what I want to say now. Up, I mean, other, you know, the medievals left the pagans around and had even pagan festivals. The Greeks, I, the Foucault talks about how they, I talked about this last time, didn't I? Okay, good. The, 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 so, the technicity takes over all the mar- marginal practices. First I'll read it to you and then I'll tell you what the phenomena looks like. On 27, in the first full, pa- second, yeah, first full paragraph, third sentence, where this ordering holds sway and drives out every other possibility of revealing. Above all, in framing conceals that it's uh, that it, it revealing itself in the sense of poesis. Ooh, there's that misleading thing again. That's what presence has come forth and appearance. Oh, I don't know what you talk about first. I think I'll go to that in a minute. That's the kind of sentence that is very confusing. But the previous one is easy. So where technicity holds sway, it drives out every other possibility of revealing. That is the marginal practices. I mean, in, in medieval times, they still had poesis around, even though uh, 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 being creatures and being a shepherd of creatures was the way you were supposed to be. Uh, but all, I mean, I mean, you want to, you're worried about this. I, just, I don't see why it follows more from, in this case. Okay, well, I think that's the right question. And I have to try to give you a phenomena out of which you can hopefully figure out I the mean, answer. Yeah. I mean, to say, and it seems like um, you can read this as a general statement about, about any it. any understanding. I mean, of it, it, it drives out any other mode of yeah. feeling. Yeah. Right. Of right. But I don't think it does. I think I have to make this point. I think it's true to the phenomena to say that any other mode of revealing says this is what's central and this is what's important and drives the pagans and the witches and so forth to the periphery where they just sort of grow on the margin. I think that's so, but I'm not sure. But uh, let me try to give you the feel of it. I mean, the, the technicity story, because it's driving toward a one most efficient, most well-ordered system, can tolerate swamps of, of, of other stuff, which is not efficient and not part of the system, I think. And take when you, I mean, this is the example I came up with. When you, if you're playing with your kid, I, or your, you don't have kids yet, but imagine your younger siblings or somebody else's kid or something, uh, you can be enjoying just thinking that's great playing with your kid. This is more true of parents. But if you're in the technicity frame of mind, you feel that you're sort of wasting your time, that this is not serious, unless, of course, you're developing the kids to be, to, their, their brains and their neurons are growing better so that they can be optimized and get the most out of their possibilities and that they're really becoming the kind of flexible human beings that they should become and so forth. Now, it's this idea that if it isn't efficient, we'll make it efficient. That, that maybe, I mean, I see that you could think of that in other uh, ways too. But it certainly does sound just like uh, science, the rigor of science. 
right? Yes, Everything. of so, course. I mean, of course there are anomalies, yeah. right? But it can't leave, let them deny right. their right. anomalies. Right, right. They have to try to turn them into Right, them. good. But you see now, that cuts both ways, but it's fine. I mean, <laughs> that's the place where, in the subject-object story, yeah. as, as, as represented by science, you're on the way to technicity, and no wonder it's in science. And, but now you can see how it's different, that you make a very clear case for it being different, Rigor and anomalies is not a medieval sort of notion. I mean, they, they don't feel obliged to make the medieval ground plan cover everything. But they burn the witches? Yeah. Yes, I know they burn the witches, but, what, but they also allow the pagan holidays. I think it's ambiguous. And, and they go out and try to convert a lot of other countries and bring them into it, all right. And, and, and yet, uh, I want to I argue this. I think, and yet, there, I told you the story, the Foucault story about masturbation, didn't I? And, and how it stayed outside and then it was all of a sudden it had to be brought in and shown to be healthy or else uh, not allowed and so forth. The, 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 the tendency to go out and find phenomena that don't fit and aren't efficient and flexible and fix them seems to be stronger in the ground plan story. So, okay, I mean, but we've gotten the story all along that the uh, world is all governing. Right, and, right. I mean, there, there, there's always going to be, and, and, and Liz is defending the other half, and it's important, whenever there's an understanding of being or a dominant style, people know what's important and what it makes sense to do, and the marginal people are understood as not important and will have trouble explaining to themselves and everybody else why what they're doing makes sense for them to do. And I guess, to some extent, the dominant ones will want to stamp out the marginal ones. But not, I mean, that's already true in the medieval story. I don't think it was true in Athens yet. It certainly wasn't true in the, in the, according to Foucault, in the, you know, in the aphrodisia part. I mean, there were chunks of human experience which they just didn't feel that because they were anomalies, they had to go find them and stamp them out. You can figure this out. Again, it's a possible paper topic to see if it's right or wrong. I do think Foucault thinks, sorry, Heidegger thinks, Foucault too, that there is something special about this ordering which drives out every other possibility of revealing, drives it out in a way that the previous ones did. Yeah. The last thing I was going to say, I think this, that sounds okay to me as long as we think of, I mean, in that makes sense, in that it's the end of history, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so that That's right. we've been achieving ever more of that That's uh, right. totalizing... That's good. And more and more world. And there's life. less and less resistance from Earth, you could say, too. Right. So that this is the last understanding of being, technicity, Heidegger says. And that's because it, it will just finally either get overthrown by a new one or get rid of all the marginal practices, making everything efficient and bringing it all into order where there's no place anymore for another understanding of being. That's what he thinks. And... Uh, uh, this line is the only line. Later he talks this phrase, the wasteland grows. And I used to think that was just a banal story, sort of T.S. Eliot or something. That everybody knows this is a wasteland. But I think the emphasis is on grows there that upsets him. That it's the way, and it's back to the anomaly ground plan story, it's the totalizing character of these practices, which is somehow more extreme. And I don't even think it's a matter of degree, though. I haven't succeeded in explaining why than the previous practices. So that's... Uh, does somebody want to say something over here? Okay, that's another important feature of it, you know, but it only gets mentioned mm -hmm. there. But, but oh, oh, yeah, I know what I want to do next. Look at that next sentence. It's very upsetting. <laughs> Above all, and framing conceals that revealing, that revealing which in the sense of poesis lets what presence has come forth into appearance. He somehow has got... You think at this stage in his life he'd be clear about this, the poesis is not the name for the clearing and the way the clearing lets uh, things come forth. The poesis is not aletheia. Poesis is a particular mode of revealing. But it looks like he equates poesis and revealing. I just want to remind us of another point where there was something weird like that going on, which was the story about productive seeing and basic questions, where it looked like... Plato turned so much into Heidegger, I mean, Heidegger was sort of talking about being as what Plato thought in such positive terms. But well, that was, so much right okay, that's, that confusing, but right, but that was a different kind of confusing. We expected Plato to be sort of 
super metaphysician onto theological and lo and behold Heidegger is trying to make him poesis and that's puzzling but then he wasn't confusing something happening in the clearing with the clearing but there was this um, it seems as if he was saying Plato or whatever productive being right really gets something right about the way in which unconcealing works Oh, I see it about the way that unconcealing works. Uh, well, if he was, and he may well have been, then it's the same puzzle again. I mean, no why he thinks that, why he shouldn't think that, it, and of course it goes back to the ultimate double meaning of the Alethea story, that the pre-Socratics understood that things showed up and that that was unconcealing. But they didn't have the, the clearing, which was what made it possible for things to show up. Yes, John. Yeah, I think you're reading, um, reading this, this line with uh, a view to another distinction that you want to make. But he's really making the comparison between the shell and police. And just wanting to say that in framing conceals. Uh, he said, we're, um, uh, in framing conceals that revealing, i.e., one mode revealing. He's just. He's just the you are absolutely right. Absolutely right. John is right. I, I canceled what I said for the last three minutes. I said it was strange for him to still be confused about this in 1953. No, he's just deciding to give an example where this ordering, namely challenging fourth whole sway, it drives out every other possibility of revealing. Above all, in framing conceals that revealing, which in the sense of poesis, Let's what presences come forth into appearance. Well, so, I'm not sure yet. What does it? So we're supposed to read it. In frame conceals that really ra- that revealing, which, for example, for example yeah, right. And the emphasis really would have to be let what presences right. come forth into right. agreement, right. as opposed to right. forces things to come forth. Right. Now, okay, then it would make it okay. So uh, that's nice to end with, with things <laughs> being okay. And, uh, oh, and and let me just see where we are. Uh, so I know, and, and we we got uh, okay, good. Uh, so on with more next time about what's that? Yes, I think I do. Wait a second. <laughs>